and welcome back. We're still talking about literary criticism, and today we're talking about deconstruction. As we've been talking about theory, we've been talking about where meaning is located. Is it located in the author? Is it located in the text itself? Is it located in the reader? There are lots of places where it might be located. Now, where does deconstruction locate meaning? It doesn't. It just destroys all the meaning. I came in like a wrecking ball! I never hit so hard enough! Yes, deconstruction is interested in the idea that meaning breaks apart. If you look too closely at any text, it no longer holds meaning. It kind of falls apart. And deconstruction is interested in that process. Let's see how it works. Okay, so we're talking about deconstruction where texts go to die. But why destroy a text? Why kill it in the first place? Well, deconstructivists come after structuralism. There was a big movement to focus on the structure of the text, the way the structure provides meaning. You might find some of that in perhaps like the hero's journey and things like that. But deconstruction is interested in the fact that although we perceive meaning in a text, we look closely and we say there is meaning, Sometimes, if you look too closely, the meaning no longer really holds up. The deconstructivists believe that language is actually uncentered. In other words, I cannot perfectly communicate what I have to say to you using language. So no matter how much I try, I'm going to fail. Therefore, anything communicated to us is, in essence, a failure. So let's say I were to say the word dog, and you would imagine in your mind a dog. And my idea of dog was this one. But your idea of dog was this one, you twisted person, you. I'm so happy and fuzzy. That's because the word dog, although it connects to a certain type of animal, doesn't hold every bit of meaning about that animal. Now, if I were to say yellow dog, we still wouldn't necessarily have the same image in our mind, although it might be a little closer. Jacques Derrida, who really started the whole deconstruction thing, he talks about how we have to continually modify and modify and modify our language to get closer and closer to meaning, but no matter how close we get, we'll never actually get there. We can just do our best. So the deconstruction kind of theory is really about the fun of pointing out flaws in others. Deconstruction works kind of like that improv game about the touchy friend. One person will be the, the normal person, and the other person will be the touchy friend. And the normal person will talk with the touchy friend, and the touchy friend will be insulted by absolutely everything that the person says. So the normal person will say th something like, hey, you look nice today. And the touchy friend will be like, what? Don't I normally look nice? Are you trying to say that I'm usually ugly? Are you saying I'm hideous? Instead of taking the meaning of what the first person says, he points out failures in the meaning. Deconstruction is a great theory for really sarcastic, really critical, really excessive people. Now you might have noticed there is a flaw in deconstruction, and that's the fact that if you write deconstructive criticism, you are going to be using language, and therefore, according to a deconstructivist, you are going to fail. Because of this, deconstructive criticism generally doesn't take itself very seriously. After all, if it pokes all these holes in these great works of literature, how can it not hold itself up to the same standard? Because of this, deconstruction tends to have a comical tone. It does poke fun at the text, but it also pokes fun at itself. There's a lot of wordplay and punning and things like that. So how do we deconstruct text? Well, in order to deconstruct a text, the first thing you have to do, and the most important thing, is find meaning. You can't pick apart the meaning if you don't have a meaning to pick apart. And this is done really in the same way as the New Criticism. So if you'd like to go back and watch the New Criticism video, it's right here. So, as with New Criticism, you usually start out by identifying the tensions in the text. And then after finding those tensions and discussing those tensions, you point out the way that those tensions seem to be unified by meaning. However, you always use those type of words that don't nail down the meaning. Instead of saying, meaning here is obvious, or the meaning is revealed by... Instead you'll say th things like, there appears to be meaning, or it seems to find meaning here. You always leave it ambiguous and vague, and then you drop the hammer. The way we do this is by tearing apart what we originally considered to be a tension. This seems to be in opposition of this. But if we show how this side is really very similar to this side, then suddenly our tension falls apart, our unity falls apart, and it doesn't mean anything anymore. It's easier to demonstrate than it is to explain. Here's a rather simple example that I've pulled from Stephen Lynn's Texts in Context. A sign on an elevator door might read, Seeing Eye Dogs Only, which is a fairly simple text. And we can assume that the intent is to forbid all animals except for those that are guiding blind persons. Therefore, there is an opposition between things that are allowed and things that are forbidden, those who can see and those who can't. But notice how if we examine the sign carefully, 
that opposition becomes less clear. We may think we know who's allowed and who's forbidden, but do we really? After all, it says seeing eye dogs only, which appears to forbid not only all other types of animals, but also all people. Only seeing eye dogs are allowed in this elevator, which certainly defeats the purpose. And after all, if a blind person has something else to guide him or her, is that not allowed? Only seeing eye dogs are allowed? Does this exclude a blind person being guided by another person? And after all, who is this sign intended to be for? Presumably a blind person, and yet a blind person can't read. Therefore, what does the sign mean? Who can say? It really is meaningless if you start breaking it down. Basically, you're looking for evidence that everything is the opposite of what it appears to be. This requires extremely close reading, perhaps even closer than the new critics, or at least close reading with a different intent. Remember that your conclusion at the end of the deconstructive criticism is always going to be that there is no meaning because the language within the piece fails. You know where you're going with deconstructive criticism, you just have to get there. It's the process that matters. It's how you break it apart. Deconstruction is sometimes irritatingly hypercritical. It's so interested in flaw and failure that it fails to see the beauty of things at times. Although deconstruction can be fun, I usually agree with Thomas Foster on this one. He says, the goal of those deconstructive readings is to demonstrate how the work is controlled and reduced by the values and prejudices of its own time. As you will have discerned, this is an approach with which I have limited sympathy. At the end of the day, I prefer to like the works I analyze. And to be honest, I do too. I'm a bit of a romantic. Thanks for watching! You can click on one of the links over here and watch one of the other literary criticism videos, or click here to subscribe. Click on the word literary criticism, and you can watch the introduction video again. I'll see you next time!